All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so this is actually going to be uh, our last sort of uh, lecture. Um, so this will be on section 2.6 still. Um, so uniform, we're looking at point-wise and uniform convergence. But in particular, what I want to focus on in this video um, is series of functions. So last time and it, on Thursday, we also talked that we all, sorry, in the last recorded video lecture, and then also at a meeting on Thursday, uh, we talked about sequences of functions and uniform and point-wise convergence of sequences of functions. Um, and what I want to shift to now is talking about series of functions. Um, so uh, I can't remember. We may have defined this in the last uh, video also. Um, but if I let f in um, some domain D into R B uh, sorry, let F in from D into R for every natural number in uh, be a collection of functions. on the common domain D then I can just sum those up and the sum n equals one to infinity of f sub n is a series of functions. So uh, just sort of to, to think through this, um, here's an example. You actually already, you've actually already seen a series of functions uh, in one of the exercise sets. So for example, I gave you the sum n equals zero to infinity of n factorial x to the n. Okay. So here I have that f sub n is equal to n factorial x to the n. Okay. And so, right, my when n is equal, actually, this is defined not only for all natural numbers, but also at zero. So, uh, when n is zero, this is just the constant function one. When n is one, this is the function f of x is equal to x, so on and so on and so on. Now, let me I, I write f sub n of x is equal to this. Um, and, and what I actually had you look at here in the exercise set. Um, was sort of to understand for what values of x does this converge. And so what I want to do is point out that really that's just asking about pointwise convergence of this series. So right, I can look at this and I can ask the question for what fixed values of x does this series converge? Because now if x is a fixed value, then this is just a sequence of, or sorry, this is a series of real numbers. And we have lots and lots of tests for series of real numbers, right? So uh, for this problem, uh, you would have used the ratio test and you actually find here that uh, this uh, series converges when x is equal to zero and diverges elsewhere. So this is just a nice series of real numbers. Um, and you can look at it sort of point-wise from that perspective as just a series of real numbers. And so everything, all the series results you already know work. Um, but we might also ask questions like, hey, when does this thing converge more than just point-wise? So for example, when does this series of functions converge uniformly uh, to some limit function? Right? Um, and so I, I want to just sort of go back and sort of think about this a little bit. Remember when we talked about series of real numbers, the way we dealt with them was by constructing a sequence of partial sums. Well, you can do exactly the same thing here. So imagine you have, uh, so if you want to know what happens to the sum 
And this doesn't have to start at one, it could start at any value. So I mean, maybe started at P and going off to infinity of F sub N of X. So we're gonna do exactly the same thing we did before. We're gonna examine a sequence of partial sums, but now that sequence of partial sums before was a sequence of real numbers because the series was a series of real numbers. But now that I'm looking at a series of functions, the partial sums are gonna form a sequence of functions. Okay. So to do this, I'm gonna examine the sequence of functions, S sub N, uh, let me sorry, let me call this S sub K of X, which is gonna be the sum N equals P up to K of F sub N of X. Okay, so same idea as before. If you want to know whether this series converges, look at the sequence of partial sums. Now these partial sums are just form a, a sequence of functions instead of a sequence of real numbers. Um, and then same thing as before, right? If S sub K of X converges, so if S sub K of X converges, pointwise or uniformly to some function s of x, then we say that this sum converges either pointwise or uniformly to whatever the limit of that sequence of partial sums was. Okay. So again, we always, regardless of whether we're talking about series of real numbers or functions, we always look, look at their convergence by looking at the partial sums. Okay. But again, just as sort of with other things, that, like, I mean, sometimes that's a good way to work with it and sometimes it's not. Um, and you'd like to have some ways of, of dealing with series of functions, for example, that don't just totally rely uh, on always going back to that definition. Right, let me advance my notes over here. All right. Um, so the, the first sort of uh, test uh, that we're going to look at, it'd be nice to, to have some test, for example, that tells us when a sequence of functions converges uniformly, sorry, a series of functions converges uniformly. And so this theorem is called Weierstrass, the Weierstrass M test. Okay. And so the Weierstrass, the Weierstrass M test uh, says, all right, let F sub N be a sequence of functions. And M sub N be a sequence of real numbers where uh, the absolute value of F sub N of X is less than or equal to M sub n. So, so the idea here is that the M sub n are sort of upper bounds for this function on whatever your domain is. Uh, so absolute value of F sub n of x is less than or equal to M sub n for all x in your domain. Uh, so I, I've got the sequence of functions and then this sort of sequence of real numbers where these real numbers are upper bounds for the functions on the domain. Uh, then the Weierstrass M test says if the sum of the M sub N's converges, then the sum of the, the series of functions converges, but it doesn't just converge, it converges uniformly uh, 
and absolutely. So this is nice because this allows you to determine something about a series of functions by just looking at a series of real numbers for which we have many, many tests. Okay. So let's look at this. Um, it's a very powerful result with what I think is sort of a, a very elegant sort of slick uh, proof. Okay, And the proof takes advantage of of the Cauchy criteria. So remember, the Cauchy criteria says that a sequence converges, uh, sorry, a sequence is convert, well, so the sequence is convergent if and only if the sequence is Cauchy. So the sequence I need to be looking at here is the sequence of partial sums of this function, okay? So uh, let's, let's then think about what this proof might look like. So let S sub K of X be the sum from wherever, wherever we start. So typically, right, the P I'm putting here is either zero or one usually, but it could be a thousand. It doesn't matter where you start. Uh, up to K, I'm sorry, of F sub N of X. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at S sub N of X minus S sub N of X. Okay, and so then, okay, without loss of generality, assume N is greater than M. So that, okay, now when I look at this difference, well, this is a sequence of partial sums. So this difference ends up being the sum, uh, let's see, I've used n here, so to avoid confusion, let me change this. Let me make this j. The s sub n of x minus s sub m of x is, um, this is the sum from j equals m plus one to n of s sub j of x. Okay. Now, I can use a triangle inequality. This is a finite sum. Okay. I can easily use a triangle inequality here and push the absolute values inside. And now what do I know about f sub j of x in absolute value? I know that it's bounded by whatever these m sub n's are. So this is less than or equal to n equals m plus one up to n of capital M sub j. But now if you look carefully uh, at what this is, this is actually equal to, uh, let's see, what do I want to call this? Let me call this, uh, oh, there's not great notation here. So let me call this S bar sub N minus S bar sub M, where S bar sub K is equal to the sum J equals P up to K of M sub J. So here, these are just the partial sums associated with the series M. Okay. So what I'm noting here is that the difference here is bounded above by the difference here. And that's, that's not really totally surprising, right? I mean, these are bounds, uh, M sub N are bounds for F sub N. And so all I'm doing is seeing that these, uh, the difference in these partial sums is bounded above by the difference in these partial sums, okay? Now, why does this help?
Well, I know my assumption is that the sequence m sub n, sorry, the series m sub n converges. So since the sum n equals p, or sorry, j, j, j equals p to infinity of m sub j converges, then well, what does that mean? That means that the sequence s bar sub k also converges. And hence, S bar sub K, this sequence is Cauchy. Well, what does that mean? Since S bar sub K is Cauchy, there exists capital N in the set of natural numbers such that when little n and little m are greater than capital N, s bar sub n minus s bar sub m in absolute values, which let me point out that because m sub n are all non-negative, this is actually just equal to this difference. And this can be made less than epsilon for any epsilon. So if I go out far enough, well, I can say so. I'm not looking at s bar anymore, just looking at s sub n of x minus s sub m of x is uh, less than or equal to this quantity, s sub n bar minus s sub m bar, which is can be made less than epsilon for all n and m greater than capital N. So what is this telling me? This is telling me that this is Cauchy, and hence, since it's Cauchy, it's convergent. So S sub K of X is convergent. Which is, well, exactly what I want. All right, sorry, I paused for a second just to erase this board because I realized I was going to need a little more room. Um, because I, I want to point out here that while S sub K of X is now convergent, we need to justify why, right? We're talking about a, se a sequence of functions now. So I need to sort of justify why it's uniformly convergent and not just pointwise convergent. Um, clearly it's pointwise convergent now. I mean, it's, it's pointwise convergent for any X. But notice that we haven't used any information about any particular x, right? So far, our proof has been totally independent of what x value we choose in the domain, okay? And because we haven't relied on that, that convergence, not only does it work at any individual point, but you're get, you have to be getting close at the same time because I haven't used anything about, um, about the particular x that I'm working with, okay? So I can actually say here that this is not only convergent, um, or this is, I'll just actually, I should just add it here. So this is uniformly. Now the other piece was that it's not only uniformly convergent, it's absolutely convergent. Um, and the reason this works actually goes back to uh, a calculation that I've now just erased, right? I had this sort of partial sum, uh, n equals p up to k plus one, I'm sorry, uh, Well, essentially, at some point, if you, you go back, I use the triangle inequality, right? And so, uh, if you go back, you'll see that I actually, I, I bounded this thing also, right? This is actually the thing I ended up bounding was the absolute value. So, since this thing was able to be bounded also, it's actually the absolute value of the series 
uh, is also convergent, which is what it means to be absolutely convergent. So again, for series of functions, the Weierstrass M test is very powerful because it allows you to just look at a series of uh, constants. Uh, but notice that it is um, it is only so, sort of a one directional theorem, right? So if you can find an upper bound for each of the functions in your series, and then that thing happens to form a convergent series, then great, your series of functions converges uniformly and absolutely. However, if your upper bounds say, maybe you even work really hard and try to find really nice upper bounds, but they, it turns out they don't form a convergent series, it may still be possible that your sequence, uh, sorry, that your series of functions uh, does converge uniformly and absolutely, but it just the, this proof isn't working out for you. Um, now, I want to spend the rest of sort of our time just looking at some very specific series of functions that many of you are, are, are probably very familiar with. Uh, and these are Taylor series. And uh, the reason I, I want to do this is I want to sort of just briefly remind us of some results of Taylor series. Uh, and then on the homework, you're going to actually be asked to prove some of these. And if you actually look at the book, it sort of gives you a structure for many of them. And it turns out you already know a lot of the pieces you need. It's almost just like piecing together uh, some different theorems to prove a lot of these results. Sorry. Um, so what, just to remind ourselves, right, sort of what, and I'm not going to write, the book writes these out as full definitions. Um, so for example, it has a full definition of a power series. I'm not going to write it out fully. Um, but a power series in general, right, is any series of the form uh, a sub n x to the n. Okay, so a sub n are just some, some series of constants. This is a power series centered at zero, um, but you can also sort of shift this and I have it centered at some other point. So here's a power series centered at uh, x is equal to a. Um, and so we can sort of prove a lot of things about these sort of power series. And uh, well, you can probably go back to a calculus book even and, and find a lot of these things. Um, so uh, for example, uh, one sort of fact is if, uh, if the series a sub n x minus a to the n converges for x is equal to b, then the series converges for any uh, x with the absolute value of x minus a less than the absolute value of b minus a. So the idea is, right, I have a power series. It's centered at some point, x is equal to a. If you find that it converges for some value b, then it must converge for every other x value that's closer than B to A. So for example, to the right, or sorry, here's distance B minus A. This would, or well, in this case, B is above, right? So it is B minus A, but I'll put absolute values because B could be below. So you actually sort of get this, and that we talk about, right, radius of convergence. So again, hopefully you've read the section. Um, we talk about radius of convergence, but here just in general, if I know it converges at some value B, it certainly must converge uh, for every value closer. And you can actually prove that also sort of by comparison, right? So if this converges for B, then this is the sum A sub N, B minus A. If you know that's convergent and you take an X value that makes this smaller, then this is a smaller series. And so by comparison, it must also converge. That's the, essentially the idea there. So, um, so, so there's lots to say about power series. Uh, you know, read the book and maybe also, you know, find an old calculus book and go back and 
you know, just refresh yourself on, on what your calculus book uh, said about these. Um, so one sort of big result that you probably saw um, in the calculus course, although it may be stated slightly differently. Uh, so suppose R, is the radius of convergence, and I'm going to abbreviate that ROC, the radius of convergence of the power series from A sub N X minus A to the N. Uh, okay, so from N equals zero to N. Okay, uh, where R yeah, is between zero and infinity, and you notice here I could put sort of equality on both of them. So you, we could be talking about zero radius of convergence or infinite radius of convergence. Okay, uh, I'm going to call this power series f of x. Okay, so then. The power series f of x, so three options. One is that it converges absolutely uh, for absolute value of x being less than R. The second option is that it converges, oh, sorry, these are, I'm saying option, sorry, my brain is dead, I'm recording this on a Friday. Uh, <laughs> these aren't options, these are all things that are true. Um, so the power series, whatever your radius of convergence is, it will converge absolutely for every X value inside the radius of convergence. It will converge uniformly Uh, for absolute value of x is less than or equal to r, where uh, zero is less than r. So r has to be sort of uh, strictly between zero and capital R. Okay. And three is that this diverges Uh, for absolute value of x being greater than r. Now, again, I said you might have seen this in calc class. Probably what you saw in sort of a calculus class is this idea that if I have a radius of convergence, you probably saw well, it converges inside the radius of convergence. You might not have, might, may or may not have said absolutely, but it certainly converges for x values inside the radius of convergence. It diverges outside. And then you probably saw something about, and then you have to check the behavior of the endpoints because who knows what might happen. Um, sort of what this, these two combined are saying is actually that it converges really nicely if you're strictly inside the radius of convergence. As you work your way up towards the radius of convergence, you may have some issues. Okay? So um, it, it sort of converges you know, it does in fact converge on for every x value inside the radius of convergence. This essentially says if you pick some closed interval, let me draw a picture here, that would be helpful. Um, so you have some value x is equal to a where this is centered. You have some radius of convergence, capital R. And so as you look at this sort of series of functions and imagine the associated sequence of partial sums, right? So that sequence of partial sums is gonna be doing something. So you can imagine like this is S1, S2, this is this sequence of, or a sequence of partial sums. Um, and then maybe sort of it's, it's you know, starting to behave a little bit nicer. But then,
So again, here's sort of the idea, right? You see these things seem to be converging inside of my radius of convergence. They're diverging outside. Right? And now the, the thing that it, it's kind of hard to draw, but we can, uh, we can talk about it is sort of the difference between these two. On this whole interval from this would be A plus capital R to A minus capital R. On this whole interval, uh, your series is converging absolutely for everything inside of here. If you want it to be converging uniformly, you need to restrict yourself to some, to pick some slightly smaller radius, right, little r. And now on this blue interval, you can actually say that your, your series is converging uniformly. Okay. So um, this is a common thing as you take more analysis, you'll see that often you see things written like, um, yeah, converges uniformly on compact subsets of some open set. Um, and essentially what we're saying here is it converges uniformly on closed subsets of this open set, right? Um, so picking sort of smaller interval, it, you can actually generalize this because if you picked this interval. Instead, it would also be converging uniformly on that interval. Um, but that's sort of generally what this is saying. Um, the, the proof of this is, well, there really isn't actually a whole lot of proof uh, to, to be done at all here, quite frankly. Um, a lot of, so, so this and this essentially follows from the definition of the radius of convergence. Right? I mean, what does the radius of con convergence mean? Well, it means that it converges when x is less than r, actually when x is less than r, diverges. Oh goodness, uh, I've made a big boo-boo here. You should all be x minus a, my apologies. I fixed, I've, I've fixed this slightly from, from what the book had written um, because I wanted to do it for the more general thing here. Um, so when absolute value of x minus a is less than r, the radius of convergence, that means it converges, it diverges here. And so really the only thing to prove uh, is sort of this piece here uh, and the book presents just, it's a very short sort of two line proof. Um, so take a look at that and make sure that that makes sense to you. Okay. All right. um, the last sort of uh, big result, um, is that, uh, or for power series, is essentially that you can take a power series, that power series where it converges uh, is continuous, uh, converges to a continuous function. It's differentiable and the derivative is exactly what you'd want it to be. And it's integrable in exactly the way you would want it to be integrable, okay? Um, and so I'm not gonna write, this is theorem 2.72. Uh, I'm not going to write out the whole thing and I'm not going to prove it because this is one of the things I want you to prove as part of the homework. Um, but essentially it says power series are really nice, right? If you wanted to summarize this, not only this sort of the power series, when it converges, it converges to a continuous function, but also that function is differentiable and you can find its derivative by taking derivatives term by term. You can find its integral by integrating term by term. Um, so that's theorem 2.72. Okay. Um, sort of the last thing that I um, that I really want to um, emphasize is that the reason we care about power series is because we actually care about Taylor series. Well, well power series are interesting in their own right, um, but really, I mean, we're, we're sort of working our way towards Taylor series, um, and so what is a Taylor series? So again, if you look at uh, theorem 2.79, you'll see sort of uh, the full, the full workup. Um, but right, a Taylor series is just a power series where we take the coefficients to be the nth derivative of f evaluated at a over n factorial. So this is sort of our, our prototypical um, Taylor series. Okay. Um, now, if you look at that theorem 2.75, and this is where I, I just want to emphasize something. So it says, suppose that f of x is equal to essentially uh, start with a power series that looks like this. 
suppose that you have a power series like this and it has a non-zero radius of convergence. So it's converging on some, you know, some actual interval, not just at a point. Um, then the function f that it converges to is infinitely differentiable and has coefficients that look like this. Okay. So really, this is a quite different, saying something quite different than what you did in calculus. In calculus, you took a function and you made the Taylor series. And what this is actually saying is, if you look at this thing and it converges to something, we'll call it f of x on an interval, then the coefficients must have had this form. Um, that's, again, not quite as strong as, I mean, right, you wanted to just start with a Taylor series. And okay, it turns out, right, for most functions, this is fine. You can sort of reverse this process. Um, but you have to actually uh, be a little bit careful uh, about that. Uh, so theorem 2.67, which is Bernstein's theorem, uh, says, okay, well, if f and all its derivatives of all orders, uh, so, so, okay, it says if f and all its derivatives of all orders are non-negative in some interval, then f is analytic. And that actually, being analytic, says that it has a convergent Taylor series representation on that interval. Okay. So I just want to point out that what you did in calculus, while well, okay, it was, turns out it was fine, from an analysis point of view, it's actually quite a bit more difficult to go in the reverse direction. So Taylor's theorem just says, if you have a power series and it converges to this function f of x, then the coefficients of the uh, power series must have been in this form. It does not say take any old function you want, build a power series like this, and it will definitely converge to f of x. Bernstein's theorem gives you some idea that you need additional sort of results in order to do this. I mean, you need additional properties of f, and, and it takes quite a bit more proof to show that, okay, I have this particular f, I can construct this Taylor series representation, and I know that it converges to this function that I started with. All right. So that is actually the end of the, the new material we're going to be covering for this course. Um, so you'll have an exercise set this week. It will combine, uh, it will be, essentially be comprehensive over section 2.6. So it'll combine stuff from the previous week um, where we talked about sequences of functions as well as some of the stuff about series of functions. Um, and again, as you're reading the book, hopefully you've seen that a lot of it is sort of, a lot of the proofs are sort of fill in, fill in the blank or explain something because we now have a lot of results built up that we can rely on. And so you should be relying on those for your homework.